My name is Sarah Falder. I'm Chief Executive of the Publishers Licensing Society. And we like to think of ourselves as um, here to provide solutions and to support the publishing industry. We are, of course, owned and managed by the three trade associations, including ALPSP. Um, can I just ask how many of the publishers in this room are already signed up to PLS? Okay, that's a few. Not every hand went up. Um, those of you who are not signed up may, may like to think about doing it. Uh, last year we distributed over £34 million to publishers from secondary licensing. That's copying and other uses of your materials beyond, um, beyond the uh, primary business. So um, we are known for collective licensing. We license um, through our agent, the Copyright Licensing Agency, and you'll be hearing from James Bennett of the CLA shortly. Um, why is licensing a good thing? Assuming you agree that it is. Um, what's very important is that it is a way of showing that copyright can work when you apply copyright, when you put it into practice. It's a way of making it work because it gives people access to things in return for payment. And, um, or not, as a copyright owner, you don't have to charge, but uh, you can choose to charge. And um, what people want most is access to content, whether it's published content or music or um, anything else. And um, they often argue that copyright is so complex, they don't understand it, it gets in the way. Uh, so we're here to show that it can actually work. And collective licensing is an excellent way of monetizing um, the use, high volume usage for low payments, low value usage, the secondary use, the photocopying. That's where we started, photocopying in schools. We've now moved on a long way to digital uses. Um, in all sorts of sectors, education, public, business sectors. So what it does is ensure that there's an orderly marketplace and it removes the excuse for infringing copyright, most importantly. Um, it also removes the excuse for any copyright exceptions, we like to think. We have to work hard to convince government that they do not need exceptions to copyright for educational usage, for text and data mining. Um, and uh, so that, that is a constant battle. So it is incumbent on us to show that copyright really is working, that rights holders are fully supportive of it, of making their content available, and um, that we make it as simple and streamlined as we possibly can. And the pressures on us grow by the day. As we all know, users are under incredible economic pressure at the moment to cut costs. And um, particularly in the education and public sectors, which are the two sectors we're very strong in licensing. And of course, there are the political pressures, the perception that copyright is, is obstructive in some way, uh, that it gets in the way of technological progress, that you know, it stopped Google from setting up in the UK or the likes of Google. Uh, these are the sort of things that we get thrown at us a lot. Um, so our response on your behalf is to show that there are simpler ways of doing things. Um, there are all sorts of, um, uh, of benefits in, in, in good licensing. And over the course of the afternoon, we're going to show you um, three very different ways in which um, PLS is working with other industry organizations to provide those solutions. So first of all, I would like to introduce um, James Bennett of the Copyright Licensing Agency, where he is head of development. And PLS and James particularly, and the whole of CLA, work very closely together. Um, so you're going to hear about some particular developments within um, CLA that are, we believe, adding great value. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, 
so uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, some of the, the uh, what I'm calling future licensing solutions that CLA has been developing uh, over the last year or so. Um, I'm calling it licensing solutions. Some, some of them don't really have that much to do with, with, with copyright, but actually fit in to the infrastructure of, of, uh, of content and rights in, in, a, in, in various different ways. So um, first of all, a, a quick headline about CLA. Uh, so we are the body that sells licenses, sells the blanket collective licenses that um, uh, organizations in the education sector, public sector uh, companies um, purchase from us to allow them to copy extracts from uh, millions of books, magazines and journals uh, for internal purposes or for education purposes. We had a revenue of around £75 million last year, uh, of which about £34 million, I believe, was distributed via PLS to publishers. Uh, and we are a not-for-profit organisation um, owned by PLS and by ALCS, the Authors Licensing and Collecting Society. So what we've done over the last 31 or 32 years since we were formed, 32 years since we were formed in 1983, uh, is um, blanket licensing, annual uh, licenses, repertory licenses perhaps you'd call them. Um, but we've got a expanded and new strategy for the future because we see that the, the environment is changing. Um, so really, what we're doing now, uh, our, our strategy involves um, three elements, really. Um, the licensing in the centre is the blanket licensing will continue, and a lot of what we're doing is actually to add value to and strengthen the core blanket licence. Uh, on top of that, where it works for us and it works for customers and it works for rights holders, we're doing some transactional licensing, which I'll explain. Um, but of course, that's only one part of the picture. Uh, we realise to add value to the blanket licences, um, we need to sometimes provide solutions that involve content for our customers, and we also need to sometimes um, help our customers with their, their workflow around content and rights. So what I'm going to do today is just give you some examples of how we're doing that uh, and how these all fit together into a kind of a unified um, strategic direction that we're taking over the next few years. So first of all, I'm going to talk about content solutions. Uh, content really meaning journal articles, book chapters, etc. Um, we are basically um, aligning the content that users are using every day with the rights that they need that sometimes come from the publisher and sometimes come from us and where it works for everybody um, putting them together so that the value in having a blanket collective copyright license is strengthened and seen as coming together with the content that the users are using every day. Uh, so th here's the example, um, what we've been doing. We have um, partnered with the British Library On Demand service. So many of you may well be aware that the British Library has for many years operated a document supply service, um, which is uh, used a great deal by UK education and not-for-profit institutions particularly, but also by corporates in the UK all, all around the world. They deliver about 120,000 copyright fee-paid articles a year. Uh, basically what we are doing is we are um, providing access to prepaid content from the British Library alongside our licence as part of a package which we administer. Um, for each different sector, so the public sector, the NHS, education, we've created bespoke agreements which work for them, um, which add value for the, to the licensing in the way that they see the value in each element. Um, one of the key areas that we're doing is, at the moment, um, for content that's supplied by the British Library and which is licensed by CLA for document supply, which is m a lot of what they deliver from print, uh, older material, um, the be able to have to have DRM on the content that's supplied so the user can print it out once and they can store it for a short period of time, but that's all they can do. So what we've agreed with them and with rights holders is that anything done under our new, what we're calling license plus agreements can be DRM free. Uh, so they can use it freely under the terms of their CLA license. So they're getting content and they're using it unfettered with a, right, a blanket license and it all comes as part of a package. Uh, and also we're administering the finances, so we send a single invoice for content and rights to these customers. Um, why are we doing it? We 
Um, as I said, we need to link content and rights in the mind of the customer to add value to the license. Um, in many cases, we're actually solving problems that our customers have come to us and said, can you help? So the NHS, for example, came to us and said, we've got a problem with this DRM. It doesn't help us do our job. And we said, well, we can maybe fix that. Um, because organizations will order documents supplied because they don't subscribe to a particular journal, it takes into account the digital subscriptions that each customer has got, and thus uh, it shows that the blanket license is for uh, uses and content on top of stuff that you already subscribe to. So it helps to differentiate the two and add value to the blanket licensing. Uh, and it provides tangible evidence in terms of actual content of the value of working with CLA and having a license in the first place. Um, one other thing which is, might be uh, not so apparent is that um, we need data from our customers to be able to distribute the revenue from blanket licensing effectively to, to publishers. And we spend a lot of time and money going out and, and sort of manually collecting that data by getting people to do questionnaires, surveys, getting them to log what they've been doing. If we get the data from the British Library about what's been supplied under a document supply service, we don't need to go out there and do any surveys because we just get an automatic feed of what's been sent to them, which means we save time and money and hassle for both us and the customer, but we get really good data to distribute the money fairly. Uh, examples of License Plus that we've been working on. So last year we introduced the first License Plus model, which was for NHS in Scotland, who had refused to take a blanket CLA license for two years. Um, we agreed with them a, a two-year deal starting in 2014, so we're in the middle of it at the moment. So we would supply them uh, a blanket license and the British Library would supply a fixed sum of money's worth of content every year as part of that agreement based on a single invoice. Uh, this was in effect a pilot. We are assessing the operational efficiencies of doing it, finding out what worked, what didn't. Generally it worked, but then we, we've developed uh, this year uh, a more uh, streamlined and sophisticated model for the NHS in England, which is our single largest customer. Uh, we, as I said, we had a, a, an actual request from NICE, um, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, to, to see whether we can do anything about the fact that they were ordering all these articles from the BL. They had to print them out and then scan them to use under our license. And we thought that was a bit crazy in the 21st century. So if we could remove the DRM and supply lots more copyright fee paid content, then that would be even better. So um, what we did is we negotiated uh, a three year deal through the Department of Health for every single employee in the National Health Service in England to be covered by the CLA blanket license and for the British Library to supply um, an, a fixed number of units of articles, so X thousand articles a year, uh, included within the, the license fee that we charge. Um, and all that would be delivered DRM free and we'll be told what's been delivered. So um, when we say a fixed number of units, it's no more than they would have already been getting, but many of those articles they would have been getting under library privilege exceptions and no publisher would have been getting anything for it. So we believe this both supports publishers' revenue streams as well as make, providing a solution for the NHS. Um, and also we've built a fairly simple at the moment portal for NHS librarians mainly to go in and check how many units they've got left, how much money they've got left, depending on what kind of model they're on. Um, and uh, this is it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward, but it means they can see what they've ordered, how much they were paid for it within the blanket license. It's extremely transparent. And of course, all this data on content supply goes into our systems and helps distribute the money from the main blanket license, which from the NHS in England is quite a substantial sum every year. Uh, the um, other sector that we've been doing this license plus arrangement for is the um, UK higher education sector, UK universities. Every UK university holds a CLA license at the moment. Um, they pay an annual blanket license fee based on number of students. Um, they also, up, up to sort of this month, were separately um, ordering scanned content and copyright fee paid content from the British Library under what they called the higher education scanning service. Um, this was DRM free when the university remembered to ask for it DRM free. Um, around 70 universities used it. Uh, the quality was pretty poor. There was, it was pretty rough scans from printed books the BL was supplying. Um, and so there were some issues with this. It wasn't really, I mean, we, we, uh, we permitted the BL to do this, but we weren't really involved. The universities, as I said, were confused about DRM. They didn't always get it DRM free. Uh, they didn't like the quality of the scanning. 
Um, and it also meant that once the BL had scanned a book chapter that had been ordered and sent it to the university, the BL had to delete it. And if somebody asked for the same article, the same chapter next week, they had to scan it again, which was crazy, we thought, and so did they. So now, beginning just last week, we've launched with the British Library what we're calling the Enhanced Higher Education Supply Service, which, uh, under which really we administer all of that service. Um, and because we've negotiated with the British Library, the universities get a high quality service. They get higher quality scanning, like preservation quality scanning. Uh, they get guaranteed 48 hour turnaround. They get OCR as, as standard. Uh, and we invoice them every month. Um, they pay a lower service charge if they pay in advance. Um, and also we're getting a copy of everything that's supplied to these universities, uh, which is supplied under license for use in the other thing, that the workflow tool that we're providing, which is also I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Um, this is all part of our negotiation strategy with the UK universities in order to renegotiate the blanket license, which we have with them through the universities of the UK uh, for the next three years. At the moment, it brings in around 15 million pounds a year for rights holders. A lot of that goes to publishers, and we want to keep that coming. So we, we are developing solutions like this to provide um, added value for the university sector. Um, so that was the content side. Um, we're expanding, uh, working with PLS closely, we're expanding our uh, licensing so that we can offer some transactional permissions. Uh, this is the only thing we're doing at the moment is for the UK university sector again. Um, we know that when a university uses one chapter under our blanket license, which is all they're allowed to use per course, sometimes they, need to, they want to actually use two chapters from the same book, but they can't do it through us. They have to go to the publisher separately for the second chapter. So we have been working with PLS and publishers to get them to opt in to a new transactional licensing scheme where the university can pay for the right to use a second chapter on the same course. Um, publishers set their own prices. It's completely opt-in and non-exclusive. Um, this is what it looks like for the university. It's a simple online tool. They log in, they purchase the, the permission, number of students, what course. Uh, we build them afterwards. Um, and the, uh, so again, it's kind of providing a tangible interface for customers to, to enable CLA to be visible as providing a service. Uh, again, it's all part of negotiating this future licensing fee um, and delivering revenues to publishers. Um, the final area that I want to talk about is um, workflow solutions. So we talk a lot to information managers in the various sectors we license. They, these are people who care about copyright, they care about compliance, they need help sometimes in dealing with issues around copyright and licensing. Um, and so we've really delved into how we can really help in the long term our customers. Uh, and the first sector that we are working on is on perhaps unsurprisingly the UK university sector again because they are one of our biggest customer sectors, they're extremely copyright compliant, they understand the law and there's already a license in place which we can tweak and make better. So um, at the moment the current UK higher education license, uh, they can copy one chapter or one article from millions of different publications but they have to do this thing called census reporting which is telling us everything that they do. So when they scan a book, chapter, or an article for a, when I say scan, about 80-90% of what they do is still scanning from print. It's not very digital because this is stuff that they don't subscribe to, so they scan. They have to tell us on a spreadsheet what they do. Every single university has to tell us everything. Uh, it's an onerous task. Uh, they have to, every year, renew and tell us what they did, whether they still want to use those scans. Uh, this has all been part of the license for several, more than five years now. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's an analog manual process. Uh, sometimes they pay extra for workflow tools to help manage the CLA license uh, to third parties, private companies, um, which um, in some cases are very good, in some cases are really clunky and approaching the end of their lives. Um, but we know that uh, generally it's the reporting that's the problem. Um, customers don't really want to do it. The other thing about the license at the moment is that um, all these different universities are, are we know they are scanning the same chapter from key books that are key topic books for the for courses, uh, but they're all scanning the same thing. They're not. There's no kind of um, efficiencies there. So there were some areas that we felt we could uh, provide some kind of solutions. So 
Our solution for the UK HE sector is called, we're calling it the Digital Content Store. Um, it's more than just a store. It's definitely not just a repository, and I'll explain what it is in a minute. Um, it is a centralised, secure, CLA-operated content store for the universities to, score, to store the digital copies that they make under our licence, uh, rather than them all storing them individually on their own servers, which may or may not be secure, and which, for uh, the privilege of storing them, they have to provide us with loads of onerous reporting data. Uh, what we're doing is we're including this tool, this storage tool, with, it, with an interface uh, as part of the annual licence fee going forward, um, as part of this negotiation. Um, and those universities that use it, and it will be optional, won't have to do all that census reporting. Um, uh, the, other, the other thing is it's, it's a platform for other, pro other CLA products and services which include the transactional stuff we're talking about there and the content stuff we're talking about as well. So well, both those things are kind of rolled into this platform once it's fully launched. Uh, I just give you a brief idea of the workflow. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but actually, I mean, if, from left to right, this is what happens. A librarian will need to, and it, what's great in the, UK, in the UK is librarians do it. It's not the academics driving what goes on to each course in terms of scanning it. They will request it from the librarian and say, I want these chapters on the course pack. So the librarian will use the digital content store. They'll search it. They'll look for a book chapter or an article. If they find that somebody else has already scanned that book chapter or article, then they don't need to rescan it. And under the, under the terms of their blanket licence, they're allowed to reuse it for a course. Um, if they don't find someone else has, has, uh, has, re, has used it in the past, then a file needs to be created, which will the student will access. Uh, and the, the, the whole point is that students access the files in the, in the content store uh, basically by clicking on a link, uh, and we track the data, which means they don't need to report to us what they've done. Um, so if they, find, if they don't find a file, then either they can upload it, or they can order it from the British Library under the content service I described. So uh, this is helping with the workflow, removing the need to report to us, um, and providing a better service to the librarian and, we believe, to the student who will get high-quality scans uh, delivered very quickly um, on a completely secure, robust service. Um, we, um, I mean, just to reiterate, that the, the customers won't have to do this census reporting, that they... Um, they not only do they not like it, but the, the, the fact that CLA insisted on reporting of this level was one of the key things they used when they were lobbying for an exception to, for education for, when the Hargreaves review took place. Uh, so we really, there's, other, there's, there's political and government reasons why we want to remove this reporting. Um, it also means we get much better, even better quality reporting than we used to get by having the content stored and tracked in a way that digital content is tracked by, in other ways today. Um, they, um, I mean, basically, the, the key area as well is that they don't need to do so much of their own scanning, so we can make sure that where universities are copying works to using courses, they're generally using high-quality scans provided by the British Library, either reusing ones someone made before or new ones. Um, we are, and this is a complicated diagram, but basically we're connecting up the digital content store with um, existing technologies in universities. So we're connecting it to the library management tool, so the university librarian can see whether a particular work is held by the, by the library already, and thus they're able to copy it under our license. Uh, we're connecting to the student record system, so they can tell how many students are on each course, um, and what the courses are called, so they have to type it in all in again. Uh, we're connecting to the British Library through APIs, and at the bottom, as you can see, we're getting data on usage that comes out that helps CLA distribute the royalties from the blanket licence to, to publishers and authors. Um, that's a very quick overview, really, of... Uh, actually, sorry, this, that's the slide showing, in a more simplified way, the connections uh, that we're going to be making to the other, uh, other tools that are already being used. Um, we are in the middle of our development programme, really. We've got five UK universities, five major ones, using a pilot version of this digital content store at the moment. We're using that feedback to de develop it, ready to launch next summer to the whole sector as an optional tool that they can use to help manage our licence, manage the workflow. Um, and that will be just before the new higher education licence for the whole sector, which we're currently embarking on a negotiation with Universities UK for. Um, so... 
hopefully that was a useful, if probably quite quick and detailed overview of what CLA is doing to develop new content licensing and workflow solutions for its customers. Um, and as you can see there, the examples of the three elements that we're working on at the moment. Uh, and I hope to come back next year and give a, another presentation on the digital content store in use and how it's working today. So. Thank you very much, James. Sorry. Are there any questions for James? We do have a, a roving mic. Um, I just should emphasize that one of the reasons for the complexity around data collection, um, which is what we're trying to streamline uh, and remove the cost and the admin burden from the users, the reason for it, of course, is to make sure that we can get the money that is collected to the correct rights owners, and that's you in the room. So it's when your titles are actually being used, you know, you're getting paid for it. And that's, that's terribly important. That drives a lot of, of the complexity which um, CLA are trying to, to simplify at the moment. So if there are no more questions, thank you again, James. If um, Claire and Jonathan, oh, you can stay there, okay. Um, we're now going to hear from Claire Hodder whose um, fantastic experience in rights acquired um, with the generosity of, of Palgrave Macmillan. Um, now that she's a freelancer, we're benefiting enormously from, from what she's able to offer us. And uh, working very closely with Claire on permissions and uh, clearing copyrights, which we feel is a, there's a bit of a logjam within the industry, and this is an area that uh, we're also looking to resolve and improve upon. So, Claire. Thanks, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, most of my career is spent um, at Palgrave Macmillan in academic uh, publishing, uh, looking after books and journals. Um, latterly, while I was there, I was the um, rights director responsible for, for what we called rights out, so licensing, uh, reuse of content anywhere and everywhere it might be required, but also um, I was looking after the policies and procedures and strategies around how we acquired uh, content that we sought to publish in the first place. And I think that's quite an unusual combination in publishing to sort of be able to look both ways, both at rights in and rights out. Um, and, it, and it's generally brought out um, or brought to the fore, I think, in my mind, a lot of issues there are with that disconnect across our industry. So the subtitle up there is who cares about permissions? Does anyone in this room care? Got a show of hands, who cares? Oh, lots of people, well that's good. <laughs> I won't have to work too hard to convince you then about why they're important. But I think that um, it is important that people, particularly senior people in organisations, really start to recognise um, the value that permissions can, can bring. And I suspect probably the people in this room are here because they are interested in permissions and really what we all need to do is go back and harass our colleagues and our senior executives and start trying to persuade them that they need to start taking an interest. Um, these are some key words that came up um, when we did some permissions training recently. This is how the people actually dealing with permissions feel about them. And on the whole, it's not very positive. And if they can't get excited about permissions, it's little wonder that those people higher up the food chain can't. Um, as I said, generally, senior executives just don't care about permissions. They might perhaps start caring about the revenue that licensing income can bring in. And certainly at Palgrave, um, the only time when I, a, a stream of senior executives would pass through my door was at the end of the financial year. How's it going, Claire? Everything OK? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and it's no wonder, because rights income goes straight to the bottom line, as we all know, and that's pure profit for the company. Anything you bring in... Um, from licensing, but how that income was made, what was licensed, what terms and conditions were applied, that was of little interest to anyone other than me. There's no strategic direction from the wider business about how we should be running our per permissions operation unless I specifically asked for input. Um, even in not-for-profit companies where sometimes um, the most important driver for permissions is not necessarily revenue but dissemination, but even in those companies um, when I've been working since I've left Palgrave. There's very little interest in the actual nuts and bolts of licensing. 
So besides making money, why should we get our um, senior executives to take an interest? And why is PLS suddenly taking an interest in this sleepy but dependable area of our publishing business? So permissions matters for commercial reasons. One of the things that really motivated me whilst I was at Palgrave, and one of the reasons I really wanted to move into consultancy so I could get, uh, I could see this happening on a broader scale, is because in this enormous period of transition for our industry, rights and licensing are absolutely pivotal. We don't sell products anymore. We license rights to access our servers. Every transaction in the digital space is, is based on a license. Even free-to-view websites have license terms attached. So once what was a secondary activity dealt with people in the basement who'd been there for years is now core business. A permissions licensing strategy that's developed to support your primary business objectives is now really important. Scholarly publishing is not just about content delivery anymore. It's about developing your brand by engaging with academics in new ways, enabling a community of like-minded researchers to share, collaborate and evolve. And your permissions licensing needs to be in tune with these goals. If your permissions team refuse a request from an author to post their draft article on a community site or impose an unrealistic embargo period on institutional repository request, the rest of your business might feel the repercussions. You need to make sure that your permissions team are on message. Permissions give you the opportunity to manage how your content is used beyond the product. Licensing terms can ensure the integrity of that content is maintained. The author's moral rights aren't infringed and that any possible impact on your primary business goals are, are mitigated. For instance, you might decide to limit the amount of archive content you are prepared to license to a university until your sales colleagues have been able to see whether they'd be interested in taking out a subscription. And licensing can be a marketing opportunity as well, giving you access to readers and potential authors outside of your core market, introducing them to your brand and your quality content by means of a well-crafted acknowledgement. Sarah alluded to earlier, permissions matter for political reasons too. Copyright's been the source of a lot of tension in recent years. Inquiries at UK and EU level trying to get to the bottom of whether copyright's fit for purpose in the digital age. Does copyright enable creativity to flourish or is it a barrier? Consumers are demanding immediate access to an increasingly broad range of content. Social media lets us create, blend, share content instantaneously. Consumers want to consume that content anytime, any way they choose, including be being able to remix it with other types of content. Online retail and a plethora of new online services have transformed our expectations in terms of transaction speed and customer service. And against this backdrop, copyright does seem archaic and out of step. And you can see why there are arguments to broaden copyright exceptions, to allow much greater use of creative content without the need for bureaucratic and often expensive right hold, rights holder authorization. But what about the rights holders? Enabling a greater use of content under copyright exceptions removes their ability to have a say in how their content's reused and reduces the opportunity to see an economic return on their creative investment. Creators need to pay their bills too. And whichever side you're on, permissions are at the heart of the argument. So this next slide summarises the, pos the positives of the permission system for rights holders and the issues faced by rights requesters. Ironically, as, permission, as publishers, we're acquirers of permissions as well. And this list of negatives uh, on the right-hand side there impacts heavily on us, or more likely in academic publishing, on our authors who we make responsible for clearing their own permissions. For a first-time author or even an editorial assistant, navigating the complexities of permissions clearance, trying to match the myriad of rights their publisher says they must acquire with an assortment of licences coming in the other end, all applying different terms can really be the stuff of nightmares. And I've cancelled many academics and editorial assistants through that pain. Um, if author care is high on your list of objectives as a business, then it would be prudent to think carefully about how you could support them in this area. And the way that we as right hold, rights holders manage permissions has a direct impact on whether copyright is seen to be working or not. If we want to keep copyright, or at least stave off broad-ranging copyright exceptions that may pose a risk to our business models, we need to ensure we have a modern and fit-for-purpose permissions business. The objections from rights holders would suggest we're a long way from that right now. And PLS research backs this up, finding that over one-third of permissions requests 
are abandoned because they're too difficult to progress. Initiatives like the STM Permissions Guidelines, where signatories offer reciprocal gratis permissions for low-level use, and the large amount of content now available on an open access basis under Creative Commons licensing, does help simplify some clearances, but there's a significant body of published content where rights holder authorisation is required, and we have to make the clearance process more straightforward. And I think we've got four key areas where, from our research, we think um, cause particular problems for rights requesters. The first of those is locating rights holders. A piece of content may have many rights holders. Rights may have been assigned by an original creator or licensed for a specific period of time. Once licensed, they may have subsequently reverted. It can be a complete minefield just trying to work out who has the rights, with requesters being passed from pillar to post and back again in their quest to find out who has the right to grant the permission. And then having established who the rights holder might be, they have to work out how to content, contact them. And in some cases, there's good, clear information on a permissions website. But more often than not, permissions information is tucked away without any clear signposting. And I always think it's fascinating, it's a particular trait amongst American publishers, that if you do manage to find the part of the website that says where you can get permissions from, they always insist on uh, permissions coming to them via fax only. You've got to try and find, who, who's got a fax machine? Um, the second problem for requesters is response times. Um, we have had lots of uh, permissions requesters telling me it just takes too long to clear permissions. So I googled some publishers' expected response times, and I took an average of the first 20 publishers that came up, and the average uh, response time was almost five weeks. Um, and half of the published response times were in the five to eight week bracket. Um, I said I'd been speaking to rights holders recently. One of those I spoke to said he'd recently had to wait 12 weeks to get a response. Is that sort of response time acceptable in 2015? To put that in context, it takes a week to apply for a provisional driving licence. To get a mortgage offer, the average time is two to four weeks. To apply for a passport, three weeks. To apply for a blue badge, one of those disabled parking permits, takes four to six weeks, but that does include the time it takes to carry out a walking assessment. And there we are at the bottom with permissions taking five to eight weeks, potentially. I'll leave it to you to decide whether that's acceptable. The next problematic area for requesters are terms and conditions. The terms of the permissions licence have changed very little over time. There's still an enormous reluctance to grant digital rights on terms that are realistic for online publications. People are insisting on fixed print run limits, um, limiting your ability to include a product in search inside, or even confusion about creating derivative works. Licenses are evolving slowly, but the terminology being used varies between rights holders, and users really aren't sure whether permission covers the use they need or not. If you have a project with multiple items of third-party content, each, li each licensed from a separate rights holder, you can find that the terms and conditions for each of those uses varies enormously. Um, and you might find that they vary so much that the, the combination of rights that you actually can do something with limits the viability of your product completely. Uh, and you might even have to um, drop those permissions requests, drop even uh, publishing the product at all. Just Something I'd like you all to do when you get back to your offices is go and have a look at the permissions terms you offer people who want to reproduce your content. Look at those terms and conditions and see if you were requesting permission from a publisher who gave you those same conditions, could you make your products work? It's amazing the disconnect between what publishers ask for and what they're prepared to license. And I think if we can't even make permissions work for each other, we're going to have an impossible job persuading governments that we can make it work for the wider world. The final major issue for requesters, I think, is pricing. The way that publishers' permissions departments are set up is not conducive to managing micropayments. The interviews we've co conducted with, rights hold with permissions clearance staff suggest that invoicing and payment are one of the most difficult areas for staff to manage. They're forced to hike up fees to cover the cost of accounts departments administering the payment, and therefore price is often not proportional to the perceived value of a particular reuse. 
In addition, there's a failure to take time to understand different business models. I'll give you a real example. Uh, at, at Palgrave, we published a book called The Parallel Lives of Women and Cows. I'm sure you can imagine it was a, a great bestseller, but it was a, a high-level research monograph. Um, and being charged over £1,000 for using um, literary quotations in that monograph was obviously just not economically viable for the book, but trying to speak to an American trade publisher about why that didn't work for us was, you know, it was just impossible. Um, they just couldn't understand that despite the fact that we wanted rights to publish it across a range of digital formats, the market for the parallel lives of women and cows would be the same number of very limited academic libraries that would have bought it in print. It doesn't matter how many different electronic formats we made that book available in, the market would have been the same. And, and that's not clearly understood in the wider world, and which is why we get these crazy prices going around. So it's really, in, in light of all these issues, it's no wonder we're on the back foot when we're trying to defend copyright. So we know what the issues are. Why haven't we been able to solve them? The first thing, and I think this is really quite scary, is publishers don't know what rights they have. Even if author agreements and assignment records are, are in good order, there are many other types of rights agreement which may be in play on a given work. Licenses to cover content source from third parties, editors' agreements, commission photography, and those sorts of agreements might be a lot harder to track down. Newer works and those still in commerce are more likely to have reasonable rights records, but publishers have very long backlists and control rights and content they've long stopped since making available. You may all be familiar with the case in 2008 where CUP, OUP and SAGE filed a lawsuit against Georgia State University. Um, although the judge uh, noted that copying took place in all 75 of the alleged instances, the publishers themselves were unable to prove that they owned valid rights in 64 of those cases, uh, which then had to be discounted from the case. So good rights records really are important. And at the moment, they're just not up to scratch. Second reason why we haven't been able to solve these problems is, is linked to the first, poor systems and data management. There's no data standards for recording ownership of acquired rights. And while some publishing systems may track commissioned rights, these aren't necessarily linked to systems that manage the license rights or the rights that you're actually looking to license out. And consequently, working out the rights petition, position for a particular title is very often a manual and time-consuming task, reliant on the skills and experiences of permission staff to ascertain whether a license can be granted at all. Um, and systems for managing the permissions range from modules in full-service publishing systems to Excel spreadsheets to still people using card index files. Without good data and good systems to extract and manage the data, the whole process becomes very laborious. There are some solutions like CCC's Rights Link and PLS Clear, which we'll talk more about later, which can help you streamline the process of granting permissions. But they can't tell you what rights you have available to license in the first place. So we really need to think more about how we can fix this. And the final reason I think we're having problems is that an underinvestment in human resources. I always think it's weird. You'd have thought that decisions about what, how, when, where to license reuse of the content on which your entire business depends would be made at a pretty high level and be really strictly controlled. However, permissions licensing is routinely delegated to the most junior person in a team with very little training or support from more senior staff. In smaller organisations, looking after permissions is often tacked onto the responsibilities of a sales production or editorial assistant, and consequently, the time available for managing permissions is scarce and is never a priority. Even when experienced full-time staff are in place, they tend not to have a high profile within their organisations. They're not necessarily well briefed on wider business developments and objectives. Price matrices, times and conditions, working methods tend not to be regularly reviewed. Consequently, they can become misaligned with the way that the business seeks to acquire permission and, more importantly, have potential to directly conflict with, with the strategic aims of the business. So what can we do about it? We need to work together as an industry to drag our permissions businesses into the 21st century. And PLS are taking a number of initiatives to support publishers in this area. Firstly, I mentioned earlier, we've been running a training course called Straightforward Permissions which helps rights holders to put in place sensible procedures and think more strategically about how they license content. 
uh, and we hope to um, support this further by developing a book in due course. PLS offers consultancy to rights holders to help them get to grips with their permissions business and in addition offers a full service option for rights holders who wish to outsource the management of permissions completely. And we've also developed PLS Clear, a permissions management tool for rights holders and requesters and this could be a great way of supporting your authors um, with permissions clearances. PLS Clear brings the vision of the Copyright Hub, which we'll hear more about later, a lot closer for the publishing industry and I'll hand over to Jonathan in a minute to tell you more about the, how PLS Clear works. What can you do as publishers? You can take responsibility for understanding what intellectual property you have and documenting it. You can think about permissions strategically. How are your permissions policies affecting your business and the wider industry? Are they meeting their potential in terms of revenue generation, reputation management and content integrity? Build your licensing strategy with these questions in mind. Resource permissions appropriately, ensure that staff have dedicated time to manage them, provide training and involve permission staff in business planning so you can align permissions policy with wider business objectives. Are you proud of the permissions service you offer? Is it value for money? Does it deliver what the customer needs? If not, make some changes. Make use of the available technology to ensure processes are streamlined and consider using PLS Clear, there are other systems available, uh, or asking PLS to help you review your current working practices. So I just want to finish by uh, making a plea, which is to please start caring about permissions if you don't, and please start getting your colleagues to start caring about permissions. If we work together to make sure our permissions businesses are truly fit for purpose, there are some significant advantages. In addition to driving revenues and, licensing and increasing dissemination of your content, we can make copyright work and ensure that the important balance between the needs of rights holders and the users of creative content is maintained. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, before we go on to questions for Claire, if you'd like to come and sit up here, Jonathan Griffin is going to uh, take you through our PLS Clear service. Jonathan is Head of Business Development at PLS. Jonathan. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just spend um, five minutes or so talking in a bit more detail about um, PLS Clear. Um, so, the service launched um, towards the end of last year, uh, and um, it's essentially um, a dating service. So the idea is that we bring together um, requesters and rights holders. Um, and the service um, makes it easier for people to find who they need to speak to. Um, and it does this using um, our bibliographic um, and contacts um, database. And it also um, ensures that they have um, the right kind of conversation as well. And it does this um, using a um, very sophisticated um, permissions, interactive permissions form that um, we have developed. Now, um, the service is seeing um, good use. What um, publishers are doing is um, they're in putting links um, on their um, home pages or their contacts pages, and that replaces um, contacts form and uh, contact forms, or um, that as in this example here, um, they're including a search widget on their permissions pages, and um, the the service is um, seeing very good use. Um, and one of the uh, publishers who adopted the service early um, reported that they've seen um, the number of permissions requests that are actually making their way through to them, um, because they're doing this, have increased by three and a half times. And that hasn't resulted in a corresponding increase in um, processing time either. Um, so that's very positive. And obviously, if you would like to use the widget or um, the link, then I'd be happy to speak to you afterwards. Now, we, we've developed um, PLS Clear as a, um, a platform that can be used to, to solve various um, uh, licensing issues that arise. So another application of the um, service is, um, relates to text and data mining. Um, so um, we've customized PLS Clear um, so that it facilitates particular issues that arise around text and data mining. So research, it brings researchers and publishers together. Um, researchers are able to um, cut and paste um, collections of DOIs into the, into the service. Um, and 
Um, once they've done that, um, they fill out um, what is a customised form which has been developed by um, a publisher's steering group that we put together to ensure that the right information goes to publishers such that they can grant access. Again, I, I would encourage you, if you have received or, or you are expecting to receive requests in the future for text and data mining, that you add a link to this, to this service on, on your contacts page. Now, moving on, um, I'll just, um, I want to talk briefly about a release of, of PLS Clear that is imminent, um, and that adds two new important um, features. Um, We've concentrated on um, free of charge permissions um, and we're, we'll enable the automation of free of charge permissions. And that's the reason why we've, contacted, uh, we've, we've concentrated on it. We know that for an average publisher, about half of all requests are free of charge. Um, and more than that, we know that the processing time is, is equal. So um, if you... Um, um, decide to use this version of the service, um, it, it gives you the potential of cutting your costs of, of um, managing permissions by, by half. Um, and we understand that it's really important that you maintain control, so this is the way it works. Um, as a publisher, you're able to specify the terms on which you automate free of charge licenses um, by type of user, by, by content amounts, and you can also um, using uh, a list of your titles, opt-in and opt-out titles. Uh, <clears throat> a second um, um, uh, major feature of the new release um, is that it enables um, you, as you manage your permissions, um, to use a request manager so that you can have an oversight of all of your requests, the status of those requests. You can also respond to um, uh, requests, um, you can send out quotes, you can um, issue free of charge licenses if you want to do it that, that way. So as I say, that, that's imminent. Um, and the next developments that we are currently working on are relate to um, auto, um, creating that same facility to automate STM agreement permissions and, and perhaps obviously also um, charged for permissions as well. Um, so that's a very brief overview. Uh, I'd be very happy to talk to anyone about it in a bit more detail, and this is me basically shouting my contact details. So, um. so you can't miss that. Um, are there any questions for either Claire or Jonathan about this whole business of permissions? Ian, if you could just give your full name. and Ian Stewart Russell <laughs> uh, Thank from you. Bioscientifica. Um, thank you, Claire. That was a really good talk, as ever. Um, although, uh, after, after James's talk, I was very excited, and after yours, I felt a little bit depressed. And the reason is this. Uh, it, it, what you said about the engagement of senior executives in publishing houses that are IP companies. Yeah. Uh, and I have to confess, uh, I probably wouldn't be all that interested had I not had the privilege to have served on the PLS board for some time. And... and you know, with you on the, um, on the ALPSP Copyright Committee. But you, ca you came up with a, a list of things that we should go back to our organizations and do. But actually, it's very diff You know, th there is this real difficulty, and you acknowledged it yourself at Palgrave, of, of having the ear of those senior executives. Yeah. Why is it so hard, and what can we do about it? Because it's so important, and the, and the solutions that, that PLS and CCC are coming up with, uh, you know, are very slick. Um, and, and solving real problems, problems that will cause the industry um, major grief down the line in, in, in legislative circles and government circles, as, as you've said. Uh, well, you know, what more do we do? What more can we do? We're, you know, there's a sponsor, you know, we're, we're here, uh, you know, in a conference of publishers putting a, some, some fantastic information under the noses of publishers, and I'm afraid to say there are very few of us here. Um, and I find that really disappointing. So tell me what the answer is. Well, uh, I only wish I knew what the answer was. I think trying to talk about it as many opportunities as we can and really raise the profile. Um, I think the main reason is because in revenue terms, rights licensing income is pretty insignificant in a lot of cases. The people that earn the most amount of money from collective licensing revenue and from their permissions um, are grossing many times more that 
through their other um, activities. So it, it does always fly under the radar. But I think trying to get across more about the political messages, and I don't, you know, I'll, we'll see what happens in the next round of um, European uh, review of copyright. But that's when people suddenly start taking an interest when their core business model is threatened. And I think, you know, I didn't mean to depress everyone in the room, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we talked about that. So Jonathan was supposed to cheer you up by providing a, <laughs> a great opportunity to, to help manage it, um, manage it all better. But no, it is really important to try and engage senior executives. And um, yes, I think just sharing, sharing the information as much as we can, taking opportunities to speak about it as much as we can, and making sure that people really understand the political message that if we don't make this work we will have exceptions introduced that take those rights away and with it half of our business models that we're all developing at the moment. So that's why I think it's important. I haven't yet found a way of um, convincing everyone, but as I said at the beginning, that's why I wanted to move into consultancy so I could start trying to bang the drum a bit harder and get people to take notice because I really think it has a potential to have a major impact on our future business if we get it wrong. But thank you for being simple. And, and it causes <laughs> immense reputational damage to publishers. I mean, you know, those figures that you quoted of five weeks, six weeks, actually can be quite a lot longer in many cases and uh, gives publishers a very bad name. So um, we are trying to um, generate interest in this topic. You know, we. We talk about it a lot, but um, I think as an industry body, we're very well placed to try and bring everyone together. We're getting great interest in the permission seminars, which is a very good start. And you know, as we spread the message out, so it will um, increase awareness, but our, our um, objective is to really hit at a higher level and um, get the attention of, of some of the decision makers who need to get this into their workflows. And, and I think if, we, um, if we're developing solutions like, like this one um, that are really easy to adopt, um, that, that's also gonna, gonna help, I think. Okay, well, what I would like to move on to is another very upbeat and positive development <laughs> to finish the session on. And I'm going to introduce um, Caroline Boyd, who has um, come on board with the Copyright Hub, um, well, quite a few months ago now. Yeah. A year, oh, my goodness, quarter. that's gone okay. past. I'm counting. <laughs> <laughs> tick, 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 yes. And um, Caroline actually is... Um, incredibly well known and important to PLS because she um, is the architect of PLSE, which is your online management account system, and has worked very closely with PLS for a number of years and understands what our needs are and, and publishers. So to have her now fully integrated into the workings of the Copyright Hub is, is wonderful for us. But she's here today to tell us what's really happening because I think a lot of people have heard about the Hub but don't really know enough at the moment. Hello. Um, I'm going to... Oh, I'm going to sort the clicker out. Good. Excellent. I'm going to give you a very brief context or history of how the Hub came about. Then I'm going to show you a couple of uses that we have live at the moment of how it can work. That's not everything it can do, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, then I'm going to make a shameless plea for good data, but I'll rush over that because I'm sure we all agree that good data is very, very important. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing, um, which would be of most interest to you in the publishing area, and uh, see what you think there. So the um, Copyright Hub grew out of Ian Hargreaves' report on copyright, um, recommended a digital copyright exchange. Richard Hooper was then asked to um, actually implement the recommendations. And the first thing he did was had a um, program of consultancy going around talking to interested people, drawing in uh, what now becomes our rather large partners board, in fact. And pretty soon he discovered, I'm going to go a bit technical here, that there were some important things happening already, one of which was the Link Content Coalition, which I don't know if you've heard of or not, but uh, <coughs> 
to briefly summarise that it's a standards body of standards bodies, but what they were working on is effectively a universal language for rights, so that we could understand rights across the different media sectors. So text, images, audiovisual, music, games, and so on and so forth. And that was very important to us. Um, that then has a um, prototype project, the RDI project, the Rights Data Integration Project, which is EU-funded. Now, I tell you about all this because we at the Copyright Hub like to be quite lazy, and if other people have done something that we think is useful, we will go with what they've done. Um, and uh, this, our, our architecture is absolutely based uh, in what is going on now. And with the RDI project, we have a great way of seeing how the um, work that the LCC did is uh, working. So in 2013, at the end of 2013, <coughs> Dominic Young was appointed the chief executive of the Copyright Hub. And in my terms, work started at that point. Obviously, a lot of work had happened beforehand too. Two strands to what we do. Um, and it's important to realize that we're not just a technical thing. There's also a lot of work, um, PR, education, talking to people, and trying to simplify copyright. I think we would say that copyright law is not a problem. What may be a problem is the way processes have been implemented that have become rather tortuous. So there's also, you know, there's a strand of activity that tries to simplify that. But I'm here today just to talk about the technology. <laughs> And the services uh, that we offer are being developed and built for us by our partners, the Digital Catapult. Um, I don't know if you know about catapults, but they're rather nice government, partially government-funded organisations. They also have to ra raise their own funding to promote different areas of the economy. And the Digital Catapult, I think, speaks for itself that it's promoting the digital area. Excellent. I have to do both. Sorry, I'm using new technology today. I'm, I'm working on my tablet and I may get out of sync. So what, does, uh, what are our aims and goals? Um, we want to reduce barriers and open up new markets. Uh, we really want to make it easy to manage copyright on the internet and physically as well. Uh, we certainly never want to interfere with existing business models. Uh, I said we were lazy. If someone else is doing something, we'd much rather they go on doing it and we integrate with them. Uh, our, one of our initial goals is to automate low-value, high-volume transactions, largely because that's an area that hasn't been addressed. It's the wild west of the internet in some ways, those tiny little transactions that probably never nowadays hit your desks when people ask for permissions. They may not even know they need permissions for these. Um, we're cross-border. We are absolutely industry-led. Um, why did I put voluntary in there? Donations to us are voluntary. Uh, we are, we're not uh, something that's being imposed by government. We grow absolutely out of the creative industries. We're non-exclusive. Anyone can be part of it. We do encourage the use of identifiers, which that will be part of my shameless plug for good data later. Uh, we're funded by the creative industries. We're freely available, which means that the software is available for free, the technology. You will never have to pay for, for it. It'll become, our goal is it will become part of what you standardly do on the internet. It'll just be something that you hook into. And the te technology is being built open source, so people can pick that up and build on top of it too. So it's uh, we're wonderfully open and uh, inclusive, etc. How does it work? Um, and actually, what does it do, which is not always uh, terribly obvious. Uh, there's been a lot of history here, and uh, lots of people have impressions of what it does. What the services allow content to do is it allows content to call home. If you find a piece of content, you can ask the Copyright Hub who you should talk to about it if you want to reuse it or if you want to use it. It's as simple as that. It does no more and no less than that. It will transmit information back again about rights, and we hope that that conversation will very often be at a machine level, because that will help automate those requests as well. But it doesn't have to be. The first thing you might just want to do, people using the Copyright Hub might just want to do, is simply ask people to contact them, to say, I'm the person you should speak to about this. You might just put an email address up when you find some content on the web. 
The um, copyright hub then connects to servers and we have a distributed system of repositories, which is where the data is held. And we have a little service that you would plug in, which will help you translate your information into our common rights format that has helpfully been designed for us by the Link Content Coalition. That all will happen under the covers. You don't really need to know too much about that. Your IT people might need to know a little bit, but only to the extent of turning on a service. It is similar to how the domain name system works, and that's one of the um, things that we will always um, say, but that's sort of you know, good for technical people. Perhaps not so appropriate otherwise, unless you set up websites every day. Um, so what we're producing is only pipe work that works across the internet. Um, it's the kind of thing that can be addressed by coders. I can't say, here's the copyright hub, these services have been delivered, click, have a look at them. It's very important, therefore, and part of my job as CTO is also partnerships director, that we work with companies who are early adopters of copyright hub, who have systems that want to make use of that uh, to get their content out there onto the web and to help that message come back that you can find out how to use content very quickly. Um, that means that uh, I'm working with what we term hub applications, which are applications using the hub, uh, across the four sectors that I've mentioned already, and there are many, many different ways that those might be implemented. But here are just a couple of the examples that we have currently live. So both of them are going to be image examples. That's the area that we're working with first. It doesn't mean to say that we're just concentrating on image. It was an area that was in most need. Uh, photographers at the moment find themselves very squeezed because their prices for their work is, are becoming commoditized. So go to the internet to find an image. Typically, people will go to Google, Google image search, find an image here, Stonehenge. What do you do next? Typically, you tend to right-click it, largely to download it, actually, to do something with it. But now, you find you get a new sub-menu. The browser can give you a new sub-menu. <laughs> knew this technology wasn't going to work. Um, and that can, with a little extra menu item, which says Copyright Hub Options. So it's really easy to connect through there. Once I click on that, the browser looks at the image, and it says, does it have an identifier embedded in it? If it does, great then it can say through the Copyright Hub, what can you tell me about this image? Most times images won't have, the metadata gets stripped off, um, and in that case it will use content recognition. The content itself becomes the identifier, and that's how we can identify stuff that's sitting around on that wild west. Once it's resolved through the Hub, the message can come back with, here, it says, first it says that the most important thing, which is that this image uh, rights are managed by Four Corners, which is a picture library specializing in travel photography. And moreover, that there are two licenses available here, um, one of which I could use for my blog, which is non-commercial, one of which I could put onto um, a website with some advertising as well. That'll be a little bit more expensive, and I can buy those straight away. So I just click on that, the button and buy through using micropayments, like Claire was talking about. And if I don't want either of those licenses, then there's a, an option to go straight through to Four Corners itself and ask about it. So that's really tying up something I've found by everyday use to the people who can tell me about it. Another example of the... Same technology used in a slightly different way, again with images, uh, is the iPublishing consultant site, that they're consultants in publishing, obviously. But they were renewing their site and wanted to use some of the images from Four Corners. So what they've done is hook into a bit of code that um, picks up which images on their site can be licensed through, that, through the Copyright Hub. So there's a little overlay there that suddenly appears where an image can be managed through the Copyright Hub. And when you click on that, again, you can go to the licensing overlay here. And actually, I happen to know that they have plans to expand that and tell you a bit more about the image too. Because if content can call home, it can also call other places as well. And it can find out quite a lot about itself and related things which the um, site can put up as well on there. Um, 
on their overlay or however they want to, actually. It's not up to us how that happens. So to do that, what do we need? We need, um, we need a trusted environment because you need to absolutely know that you're allowed to buy from the right place, that you're being sent through to the right place. We need good governance, therefore, which is in hand. And we need good data, too. So this is my little plug for identifiers. We need <coughs> identifiers for content, for parties and for people who are involved in this so that we can tell what they are, and for rights. That's fine. We'll handle the rights identifiers. Any, the hub index, really at the centre of the hub, there's an index that ties together identifiers. We're not holding any other information at all. So, um, which is why, why they're so important to us. Um, in fact, there are a couple of our hub apps that are talking only about identifiers in the music industry. Uh, Slight digression on a tangent. It takes a long time to get uh, an ISWC for a work, and the hub can be used to get a preliminary ISWC, maybe, and link those two together. The idea of tying up identifiers is uh, very powerful when it comes to systems. <coughs> Just reiterating that we're a rights data network linking together high-quality identifiers. But that's probably enough about where the hub is now, and as my son, who's in the theatre, would say, enough about me, now about my work. You're probably more <coughs> interested in hearing why the hub could be relevant to you and how that will work in publishing. First off, I'm going to show you some figures that Jonathan, um, oh, I've been there already, gave me. Um, I believe that the cost below which it's uneconomic to process permissions is roughly £60. I had a figure in my mind of 300,000 is the number of requests that are granted annually with no charge because it is simply not worth someone processing them manually. That would lead to 4.5 million if you could monetize half of those at half of the £60 cost at £30. I gather from Jonathan actually that it's 500,000 which would put the, cost, the uh, value up to 7.5 million. And that's just in terms of permissions that already hit your desk. The Copyright Hub, what it's good at is um, sweeping up the unconsidered minor things that happen on the web, the minor discoveries that happen on the web where people will find something, maybe reuse it, and you'll never know. They don't even know they should ask, hence the need for education. So these are a few examples uh, that we're currently working on. Um, the first one that we're actually genuinely working on now, when I say genuinely working on, we're actually doing work on, is um, a poetry use case. It's a new known problem, good place to start. Where people find a poem on the web and want to use it in public, a party, funeral, whatever it is, they don't always know that they need a licence for it. Uh, but we're going to hook that in through the Copyright Hub so that we can obtain a, a very straightforward and probably quite cheap licence um, allowing them to use it. It was also rather a Beezer idea that um, someone came up with that you could pick up poems and create your own ebook from them as well, but that may be slightly more in the future. Um, we're not always about communicating value, we're just about communicating what you can do with things. So the next um, hub application we're looking at with the British Library and Europeana is very much around communicating Creative Commons licenses and when stuff is in the public domain. Uh, so please don't think we're just about, um, you know, pay for a license and do that. It's just as useful to know what you can do with something when you've found it with no extra information. In music publishing, um, there's a rather nice um, company we're working with who ha they grew up, grew out of the um, classical. Uh, they, have, uh, they play in classical ensembles or sing, and they, find that they did find there was a huge problem with sourcing sheet music. They um, set up a it's kind of a LinkedIn for, for, for ensembles and classical musicians, and they're adding a search here across some of the, uh, the music publishers, um, which at the moment simply points back to where the sheet music can be obtained, but in time they will bring in the rights as well. And again, they're, they're communicating Creative Commons where that's available. Permissions management, we're obviously working um, with PLS Clear, you've heard that already, and that will be a case of bringing more requests into PLS Clear to handle those requests the way that that already does. 
Um, there are other permission systems we're working with, two or three actually, and we're interested in working with um, systems that are useful around hub, the hub so that people can build end-to-end -end services. So some of those might be payment services, and one of those is permission service that you might need, you know, would help the workflow internally in a company as well. So we, we can extend out to recommending things like that. Uh, we're working with newspaper articles with the NLA and with a couple of the newspapers as well. And um, also journal articles, um, particularly in the area of open access uh, which, and communicating that. Uh, so you can see the roadmap and you can see the ideas that have come through. Um, but we're always open and delighted to talk about any ideas. If it's sparked off any thoughts that people have, we're very delighted to talk about that. Um, we may not actually complete all of these by December this year, but maybe by December next year, I think. That's probably our timeline. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. Um, I think uh, you're describing the copy hu copyright hub as being lazy. I, I would rather say it's trying not to reinvent wheels. It's trying to join up things that already are working, are existing, and to go across all the different you're, sectors. You're right, of course. I use lazy in the really good mathematical in sense. The, in the, being economic, they're yes. trying not to spend any more money than is absolutely necessary. But um, We're very frugal with, with our, our donations, yes, of course. <laughs> um, are there any specific questions for Caroline? Yes, we've got one here. Could you just wait for the mic and give us your name? And Hi, I'm Robert Yanello. I'm from the ARM University program. Um, thank you for the presentation. Very useful. I just wanted to ask you about non-traditional or, say, non-text um, content. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, uh, videos or lear learning op objects or software code. Is that in your roadmap? Um, That's absolutely in our roadmap, yes. Um, th there's a whole educational arm. I didn't really talk about where learning objects would come in. And that's interesting because it's a mixture of content. Um, that's really one of the um, important things we can do because we have this common rights language, as it were. It's easy for us to, to talk about those rights and to pass those messages backwards and forwards. And audiovisual is, is very clearly in our... Uh, our remit too. One of the things actually in audiovisual that doesn't so much relate to your question is I have discovered there are a wealth of archives of material in the 20, from the 20th century that if we can't get those out and, and let people allow them to be used, we will lose that, which is really our history, I think. So, um, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? I think we know who the questioner is. <laughs> Hello, Audrey McCullough from Mail PSP. Um, I noticed, I love the um, option when you just right click an image yeah. and it comes up. What I did notice, however, it was below the save this image option. So if you're scanning down, <gasps> Good you can point. save the image before Good you actually. Point. I don't know, yes, is yes, it a yes, technical That's thing? a very clever thing, yes, yes. So I, I think we hope it's picked out because there's a lovely little logo there too. But I will get straight back to the dev team and I, I will add that, that comment. That's actually, actually very, no, I mean, that's the kind of thing that makes a huge difference. You're quite right, thank you. Yes. Just hang on for the... <laughs> <laughs> Good to see some Caroline, could you go exercise? back a few slides to the one that you put up about the potential revenue and the number of transactions and things? Because uh, I just had a question about that. Do you have any... Yeah, that's, that was the one. Not that one, the next one. Next yeah. one, yeah. that's it. Um, I just had a question. How many of those at the moment... You, you said that the, the, you know, these are transactions that aren't being monetized at the moment. How many of them would we actually want to be monetized, or are we happy as just, you know, as just sort of trade-offs via the STM? permissions guidelines, for instance, because it's, if, you know, great, generate uh, four and a half million pounds, but not if you're spending four and a half million pounds out on, on rights purchases. Do you, do you see what I mean? I just wonder if uh, you no, have I, a I, Absolutely, for... I do. And, and, and I'm sitting here smirking slightly because I'm going to direct that question straight back to the man who gave me those figures, Jonathan. We have those picked up, but actually that detail is better. I don't know the answer. Can I... Yeah. 
as a, someone who's granted quite a lot of these requests in my lifetime, I think there are quite a lot that I would have wanted to charge for, but they fell within that sort of, you know, there's no way of, of managing micropayments at the moment. So something that you might just, that gets requested a lot, um, and you don't, want to, you don't want to have to give it away, but if you could charge a couple of quid a time for it, you'd start generating income back for authors on that, that was sort of reflective of the amount of use it was getting. Um, so I think there, there are some, of course, you know, STM options uh, being one of them where you're just happy for it to be reused. People reusing things in thesis, for example, you don't really want to charge for that. But there are quite a lot of low level requests. I mean, I have just was struck by the, the amount of people that have been using images in these presentations, myself included. Um, I used mine from all Creative Commons <laughs> licenses, but somebody had a, a picture from Snail and the Whale earlier um, that I know that they didn't uh, request permission from Macmillan to use. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, it's things like that where, you know, actually somebody could do that and under a license you could get, it's commercial use, you can get a, a little bit of revenue that can be passed back to the creators in a fair way. So I, I think there is a, you know, there is a significant amount that you would want to charge for, de depending on your type of business. And Lots and lots and lots of little tiny bits of money do actually start to pile up, and you know that's what collective licensing is about. It's small amounts, but you know by the time it hits your bottom lines, it's quite an appealing sum. So it's it's worth bothering about, I would suggest. Any more questions for Caroline? Well, in that case, um, I'd like to thank you all for, for sitting through this afternoon. I hope you found it useful and informative. We will all be around, um, and Caroline will be here until dinner, So, uh, and others of us will be here until tomorrow. So please feel free to engage with us, ask us any questions, and um, if not now, then any time in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.